Hi, welcome to week two, lecture two for SFL 465, section two. Today we're going to be talking about the concept of self of the therapist, which basically means you, being you. And the self of the therapist is the therapist's strongest, most salient tool, which means that you are your best tool. So you means your experiences, your passions, your vision, and uh, also the relationships that you have. So today we will be talking about some of that and helping you understand a little bit more how important what you bring in to conceptualizing perception, exec execution, evaluation, all of those parts of marriage and family therapy is. So I'm going to share my screen. And here we are. So again, you are your own best tool. And you helping yourself become the best tool that you can be is an important part of this process. So we will talk about several different um, areas, self-awareness and um, self-care are essential to being the best therapist. <coughs> Pardon me, you can be. Um, so we will talk about what lenses you have. In other words, how you see the world, how you see families, how you see individuals, how you see the larger systems that they are part of, how you see yourself, how you see relationships. Uh, we'll talk about what relationships you have, both that scaffold you and provide social support for you, and also what kind of relationships you have with the families and individuals um, with whom you may work. And then we'll also talk about how do you take care of yourself. If you are your own best tool, then how are you taking care of that tool? You know, do you keep it sharp? Do you keep educating yourself? Do you prime the pump? All of those things. So let's see here. First, what lenses do you have? And just like in the lecture from uh, last time about families in context, I want to clarify that the lenses that I have are not all seeing lenses. I have my own set of perceptions and experiences and there are many things that I don't know and that I don't understand. And I always expect that I need to assess for and listen to the clients, the families, uh, the individuals that I see, assess for what's going on from them. I perceive individuals and families as being the experts in them. So I have conceptual tools, they provide me with information and then together, um, put those together and that helps me perceive what's going on in this particular situation and conceptualize what's going on in this situation and do something about it. But I never assume that I know everything that I'm seeing. I make hypotheses, I make guesses, I'll often say, so I'm going to share what I think I'm seeing, or I want to reflect back to you what I think I'm hearing. Please correct me if I'm getting that wrong or help me understand what I'm not seeing yet. And as part of our learning community, I hope you all will also share both in digital dialogue and in our lab this Friday, what you perceive and things that you recognize in yourself, both perceptions you have, um, and experiences that you have had that impact you as a tool to conceptualize things and that can also be shared with our learning community. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with this uh, saying or kind of visualization. I had spent around for a while 
Um, so you see the, we're gonna say this is an older fish on my left side of my screen says, how's the water? And the other fish says, what water? What does that even mean? So all of us have a norm and in our family that might be homeostasis, but in larger systems, we also have a norm in terms of what we expect, what roles and rules, what power dynamics, what is normal to us, what do we experience and not even think about it. We just, we don't have to think about it. For example, breathing is a norm. You're not thinking about breathing all the time unless you have pneumonia or a bad cold or you're lying down and your nose is completely stuffed and then suddenly you're like, oh yeah, that breathing thing, boy, that is important. But there's a lot about society, about individuals, about cultures that we just really don't see, we don't realize. And so how's the water is a way of saying, pay attention, um, tune in to things that you might not recognize otherwise. So we'll briefly talk about what is your water? What is the norm for you? What do you not see because it's so easy not to see it because you just expect it. And I again want to say, I mentioned this in the last lecture, not noticing things and having there be kind of the norm and the water is not a character flaw. That's how our brains work. Our brains can only pay attention to so much at a time. And so in order to be efficient, there's a lot of things that our brains just tune out and it takes intention to see and to focus on what our brains kind of on autopilot tune out. So I'm not trying to say that any of you guys are just clueless or, or that I am clueless. I recognize this is a, a natural process and one that you get to develop, you know, being intentional about what you see is something that you get to develop um, as a marriage and family therapist, or if you're not going to be a marriage and family therapist, it's something that you can develop as whatever role you're in, yours will be, um, as a friend, as a daughter, as a parent, um, as an employee, as a wife, whatever it is, um, you can choose and make intentional the decision to focus on certain things. So um, as we're talking, just think about what's normal for you, um, gender and gender norms. Is it normal for every person to have an identifiable gender? If you see someone whose gender is not identifiable, does that make you do a double take? Because suddenly, you know, the water is not clear and lukewarm. It's like, wait, that wasn't what I was expecting. Um, gender and gender norms. If you see a family that's non-traditional, um, is that what you expect? Or do you expect a traditional family? Who taught you about gender growing up? Um, what messages did you receive about your gender, uh, about another gender, about gender in general? Um, is there gender permanence, for example? Is there, um, are there gender roles that are morally uh, important? So identifying your perception of gender what you expect for yourself, what you expect for other people, what you um, notice and don't notice. Just think about that for a minute. And um, maybe you can think about times when those expectations were challenged, times when maybe you saw someone or something that wasn't what you expected. Notice how it felt. Um, how did, how did you think about that, uh, when you maybe felt something, was it a positive thing? Like, wow, that woman is really bucking 
the trend, thinking outside the box? Was it a negative thing? Like that person really is not living up to their God-given role. Um, so think about those experiences that you have had. Maybe you want to pause the video and think about it for a minute. There will be some reflection, uh, reflection questions coming up that will give you an opportunity to write about what you're thinking also. Socioeconomic status. What's your norm there? Um, I have gotten to be part of a really neat program through um, community action here in Provo called Circles, where the circle leader is someone who is living below the poverty line and the, um, the people around that circle leader are kind of allies, uh, those who maybe have different resources and can contribute those resources. And in doing training for that, one of the worksheets they give was, would you be able to live at a different socioeconomic status? And in looking at that, I was like, wow, there are skills and thought patterns and expectations from both a high socioeconomic status, which is not where I am, and a low, which is not where I am, that it would be really hard for me to live in that uh, sphere because that's not my water. It's not what I'm used to. You know, I can, I can pick a restaurant and order from a menu, but I wouldn't know what restaurant to go to in another country in the world. I wouldn't know how to order. Um, I don't have house staff. <laughs> I, I am the, the cook and cleaner unless I'm having my teenage kids do that with me. Um, so I don't know how to manage a house staff. Also, um, you know, I don't know how, I mean, I could probably figure it out, but I don't have the, what I, the knowledge to change my own oil in my car, um, or to, um, find, um, you know, if I was homeless and had no meal, would I know where to go to get a meal? Like that would that's not skills that I have. So as you think about socioeconomic status, when um, have you been exposed to something that's different than, than what you're used to that you were like, whoa, that's how do people live that way? And maybe how do people live that way in terms of that's so much consumption or that's so much money to spend on something I would never spend money on. Or maybe it's how do people live that way? Like, how do they get by without the conveniences and amenities that I'm used to? How would you get by without hot water or um, fearing your electricity is going to be turned off at any day? Or your cupboard is completely bare and now what do you do? So um, thinking about those things, experiences that you've had, uh, as you look at different socioeconomic status um, you know, spheres and what you notice. And then what is your water like? What is normal for you? And as you're dealing with families that are in different socioeconomic statuses and they talk about things, being able to maybe ask what, what that's like for them uh, or recognize that they have experiences and skills that aren't yours and um, how do you respond to that as as a therapist as a person as a human race and ethnicity what are you used to seeing um, i moved to provo as a young person from nashville tennessee that's where i grew up and went to high school and tell you what, Utah Valley looks a lot different than Nashville, Tennessee in terms of the diversity, the races and ethnicities. And I notice that having spent the last six years now in Utah Valley, I'm kind of used to seeing a lot of white faces. And when I see a person of color, I'm like, oh, 
oh, somebody else, somebody that's a little diverse that looks different than me. Uh, it feels like an honor to have somebody like that around here. But maybe you grew up in a place where there's a lot of diversity, and so diversity is normal. Maybe um, your experiences as a white person, if you are white, are things that you haven't even noticed. There's a great article, um, pretty short, that I recommend all of you read. That's in the readings under content for this week. Um, talks about the invisible backpack and things that are part of the experience of white people that we don't even realize are part of our experience. And it takes um, seeing differences to realize what is normal for us. Maybe you've never had an experience of being in the minority visually. Maybe you've had experiences in which you were the minority visually. People could just look at you and knew that you didn't fit with everybody else. What was that like? Um, what are some of the privileges that you have had? What are some of the disadvantages that you have had? Uh, what are some that you notice other people having? Ability. We talked a little bit about this in the last uh, lecture also. As an able-bodied person, I have advantages that I often just don't think about. It is easy for me to use any stall in a public bathroom. Don't think twice. It's easy for me to get up and down stairs. It's easy for me to be able to read a sign. It's easy for me to do well in school. All of these things and the systems that are set up that kind of play to those strengths or those privileges or abilities that I have are things I don't think about very often. But if I have a client come in and maybe mom has MS and is in a wheelchair, I need to be able to realize that her experience is going to be different than mine. And if my office is on the second floor of an office building, do I have an elevator? Now, luckily, because of ADA requirements, uh, pretty much every office building is going to have an elevator. But um, what about in my home? What about if I have a friend who um, has a disability? Will they be able to easily come into my home? Or if I have, um, for example, a, an assessment and I have a, a client or a patient who is blind, do I have a way to administer that self-report assessment for someone who's blind? Or am I just assuming that everybody has the same abilities that I have? So recognizing how my assumptions impact how I see other people or can't see other people um, is important for me being the best tool I can because I want to be able to ask comfortably what is it like for you to uh, have that experience how does that impact things in your family how do, do the resources that you have or don't have impact things in your family sexuality um, and this can be um, sexuality between me and my husband. It can also be sexuality um, in terms of, you know, how do I feel about LGBTQ issues? So maybe you have norms about what you expect. Maybe you have a friend come out as LGBTQ. <laughs> I mean, that could be anything. Um, and What's your reaction? What, how do you see that person? Are you aware of how the environment, since we're at BYU, how the environment at BYU may impact them? Um, how about the community? How about their family? You know, would you think to ask, have you come out to your parents? How do your parents feel about this? What about your siblings? What about your bishop? What is this gonna mean for you? So 
um, those issues um, are also ones to be aware of as a therapist. There's also issues uh, in terms of a marriage and sexuality there. Being able to ask, how is your sex life? And are there ways that you feel that your sexuality impacts the marriage? Sexuality does impact a marriage. And when there's not that source of connection or there's conflict about that, it is both an indicator of broader issues and also an impactor of broader issues like you know, we're systems theory. So we don't say it's a one way, you know, if there's conflict, then that impacts the sexuality and there's less sex. We also say having there be less sex impacts the amount of conflict. This is a circular uh, and can continue to be a positive feedback loop. Education level, that goes along really closely uh, with sex socioeconomic status, but Maybe as a PhD educated therapist, I have a patient that comes in that doesn't understand when I use a certain word. And I need to tune into the fact that their experience is different than my experience and be thoughtful of that. And be thoughtful of that both in our relationship and maybe thoughtful of how their educational level has impacted their ability to get a job, has impacted, which then maybe impacts their supporting their family, which maybe impacts uh, the socioeconomic status. So education level, uh, recognizing what is your norm. I happen to come from a family where my dad had a PhD, my mom had a bachelor's degree. Uh, we used big words in my family and that was normal to me. And so I need to tune into and be aware of people whose experiences were different than mine. Religion and spirituality. Uh, when you have a couple come in that maybe is not LDS or is, has been LDS and has now left the church or a family where a child is in the process of or has left the church seeing how that impacts them and recognizing what i assume like maybe i assume that staying in the church is the right thing to do or maybe i assume that the parents should be really loving and accepting of a child who leaves the church either one recognizing that my lens is going to impact how I perceive the family and then honing that so that I can um, ask how things are impacting them and recognize that my lenses maybe need to be cleaned or need to be adjusted. And instead of making assumptions about what should happen, I find out from the family what is happening and how they are feeling about it. So that's kind of a overview of understanding the lenses that you are coming to things with. Um, being able to use intention and focus to examine things that you maybe don't examine otherwise. Let's see here. So a reflection question. And this is one to write about in digital dialogue. Uh, hopefully you can see the graphic here too. What are your experiences with privilege? And we just in the last slide talked about a lot of different areas in which there may be privilege. We talked also in the last lecture about um, contexts in which there may be more power for you or less power. So what are your experiences with privilege? What are your experiences with disadvantage? What are your experiences being in a mi minority or a majority? And that can be in any sphere. It can be within your family. Um, maybe you were the lucky oldest child and kind of the golden child 
who could never do any wrong in your parents' eyes, and that was a privilege. Or maybe you were the scapegoat in your family and felt like you couldn't do anything right. Uh, maybe there's uh, gender issues that come up for you. Maybe as um, a woman, your desired field of study felt less possible to you because you also felt like you needed to be able to prepare to have a family. And so was that, you know, was that a disadvantage you faced? Or maybe it was a privilege. Maybe it felt like a privilege to be able to study what you want to study. Uh, being in the majority or minority, that can be religion, it can be gender, it can be socioeconomic status, it could be education, it could be um, race, any of those things. I look forward to reading what your experiences with that have been. Okay, so these questions aren't so much for digital dialogue, but something for you to just think about. And because we will be writing a self-reflection paper, which is due next week. So I think it's due end of the third week of this class. Um, but please check the syllabus to make sure I'm right on that. I don't want to lead you astray. Um, and if we have questions, we can talk about it in the lab. But these are some questions that may be helpful for you to consider as you are writing that self-reflection paper. The both of last uh, the last lecture on context and diversity, and this lecture of self the therapist will both have elements that you'll want to include in your self-reflection paper. So, what is something you like about your cultural background, and something you find hard to deal with? And that cultural background, like I said, can be the way gender is perceived, the way sexuality is perceived, could be religion, ethnicity, any of those aspects. It could also be your particular family culture, the way you express emotion or affection. So something you like, something you find hard to deal with. How was your family gendered? What were the rules for gender behavior? and who in your family, if anyone, didn't conform to those roles? And how did they not conform to them? Uh, maybe you could ask yourself the question, and I think I brought this question up earlier also, who did I learn about gender from? Who did I learn how to be the gender I, I identify as from? Or if I don't identify as a particular gender, you know, maybe I'm non-binary or gender non-conforming. Where did I get those concepts? Where did I get the ideas that that was okay? And if that's the case, how did that fit in my family? What was your, or what is your class background? So a socioeconomic status. And what changes have you or others in your family made to that because of marriage, education, work or career? religion or immigration. And you can go back multiple generations from this if you'd like to. Uh, I have my most recent uh, forebearers from a different country who immigrated were from Germany and they immigrated um, as part of a revolution in which the kind of intelligentsia were the persona non grata and so they left. So I come from a family history where education is really uh, important. It's really valued. And that impacted um, socioeconomic status for my family. When did you feel other in a group and how did you and others deal with this otherness? So that could be gender, could be race, could be religion could be sexuality, it could be um, socioeconomic status, any of those things. What were you taught growing up? And remember, these 
do not have to be explicit teachings. They could be things that you are aware that you saw, so more implicit rules or implicit expectations. What were you taught growing up about race, education, gender, social class, and ability? How have things or how have your understandings changed over time? I definitely, like I said, grew up in a family where education was valued highly. I also grew up in a family with four girls and one boy, and it was a pretty traditional family. And my dad taught my brother a lot of computer programming, which was kind of my dad, what my dad did then. And so my dad, my brother was able to get a computer programming job in middle school. None of the girls were taught that, and none of the girls had jobs uh, in until we left for college. So, you know, that kind of was one of the things. And as my siblings and I have talked about that, the other girls were like, "Why was that?" I guess Dad was very kind of had some clear gender roles and ideas about uh, who needed to know what and where to put that time and energy in terms of teaching a child. When I was growing up, that didn't seem abnormal. I never thought twice about it. And again, this is, this is a part of how our brains work. What you grow up with just feels normal for better or worse. That feel that homeostasis feels comfortable, normal. What water, like this is just how it is. As I had other experiences and other insights as I grew up, you know, it, was, it was later on when my sisters and I were like, why didn't we get taught any of that? My, our understandings changed over time. Okay, knowing your lenses. So those questions that we went over, the understanding your water, uh, it kind of all feeds into this of, of knowing your lenses and using the lenses that you have. Once you know your own cultural assumptions and perspectives and expectations and assumed power dynamics and structures and values and all of those things, that will help you to use that lens, but also to um, bring in, maybe you need to bring in other lenses. Maybe you need to expand your lenses. Maybe you have you know, one prescription and now you need bifocals. I don't know. Um, learning the basics about other cultural assumptions, perspective, perspectives, expectations, assumed power dynamics, structures, values, and how they experience our culture or how they maybe experience you can be really important. We'll talk next about relationships and the lenses that you have will be communicated in therapy. And if the clients that you are working with have lenses that are very similar to yours and swim in water that is very similar to yours, it might not be a big deal. And maybe nobody will even notice it. And maybe it will feel like a good fit in therapy because you share the same lenses. But on the other hand, if somebody, you know, you're, you in communicating will share your, your perception and it really doesn't fit, then what? Then what happens? How does that impact the relationship? How does that impact how you see people? How does that impact their perception of you and how they are perceived? Because that therapeutic system is also a system. Remember, and I've talked about this a little bit um, both last time in the last lecture and, and this time too. But remember that you are not the expert in someone else's experience and culture and that no two families are the same. Remember that you bring your culture into therapy with you. Your lenses come with you. There's not really a way to take them off. We do not get to be God in this life uh, who sees all and understands all. We can work on it, but we're not there. Um, so what we can do is check our assumptions. Remember to reframe. So maybe you see something that feels uncomfortable to you or you don't understand it. And it is, you maybe notice, I feel negative about this. Maybe I feel negative about the fact that um, this wife has taken on the 
the role of breadwinner or maybe I feel negative about the fact that the husband doesn't want the wife to earn any money I don't know so I notice that reaction in myself and then I can reframe and reframe means what other lens could I bring in to see this in a different way? Is it possible that that this what I'm seeing and and having a negative reaction to is actually a strength? So being able to see it in the context, being able to see how it impacts the family, and maybe the way it is impacting the family is a weakness or a problem in some ways, maybe in other ways a strength, maybe it's maintaining homeostasis in some way. But being able to reframe it, to shift your perception, um, to see things in new ways can be really valuable. Ask, listen, observe, reflect, check in. Check in with yourself, check in with the family, ask, are there things I'm not getting about this? Are there things you think I wouldn't understand um, without you explaining them to me? Can you explain them to me? It's all valuable. Okay, so relationships next. Um, therapeutic relationships and relationships that are thera therapeutic or good for the therapist. In common factor studies, and common factor is like what across the board tends to create positive change in therapy? What are the factors that go into having the outcomes that we want in therapy? So common factors uh, include things like the, the qualities that a patient or, or family bring in to therapy, what kind of hope they have, what kind of expectations they have. Um, it's also, for example, uh, what the therapist brings. But across the board, the biggest therapist influenced factor is the relationship. So when a relationship between a therapist and the clients feels safe and open and understanding, there is much more likely to be change. So how do you provide that? Well, you as a therapist also need to have experiences in which you feel safe and understood and seen and valued. Goes back to that foundation I talked about in the first week. We all need to feel those ways. We all need to feel like we're loved and lovable and have something to contribute and we're capable and accepted. And when you feel that way as a therapist, it's much more possible to give that. Also, uh, Sometimes the things that you hear from clients are heavy and hard. And so you being able to, well, you won't talk about specifics, but being able to get kind of emotional energy from other sources can be really important. So relationships are key, both between therapist and client and, um, well, for the client with other people having that social support system and then for the therapist having the social support system. You need to have healthy relationships to rely on. You need to have support. And that can include people with different perspectives. Having people who have different perspectives who you respect and who respect you can be so valuable in expanding those lenses. And you need to create healthy relationships with those you work with, meaning that there is connection, there's a sense of, um, well, and we'll talk about this in just a minute, unconditional positive regard, meaning you see good things in that person. You don't blame them for everything. You see them as part of the system. You see that they're doing as best they can. Now, there are undoubtedly people in the world who are doing really, really bad things. The people who you see in therapy who want to make changes or who are part of a system that wants to make changes are usually gonna be people who are doing the best they can. And that doesn't mean that what they are doing is the best thing for them to be doing, but it means that they merit your positive regard. And so creating those relationships is, is important. 
Okay, here's a reflection question for you. What relationship or relationships most sustain you? And what types of relationships have inspired you to make positive changes? So that's, that's an important one to think about as you are, you know, have, you have your learning goals, you probably have other life goals. There's probably ways in which you as a person want to progress and change. What kinds of relationships inspire that change? And we'll probably talk more about this throughout the semester, but one of the things I talked with clients about yesterday is this human um, belief somehow, even though it goes counter to our experience, that criticizing someone will inspire them to change or that criticizing ourselves will somehow inspire us to change. Turns out that's not the case. And as you write about what relationships have inspired you to make positive changes, you might notice what qualities uh, you noticed in the person, but also in the relationship. How did you feel in that relationship that gave you the gumption, the impetus to make changes or that empowered you to make changes? So some reflection questions for you. I love this little cartoon. The dog who is a therapist says, well, I think you're wonderful. And the person smiles and there are tears. Sometimes uh, those basic human needs that we've talked about of needing to feel valued and valuable and loved and lovable and accepted and competent and trusted and safe are not there for people. And sometimes the therapeutic relationship is one of the first or only places that they begin to feel that way. And that is powerful. Um, so I have their acceptance is a prerequisite for change. Now that can be a little confusing. It seems like acceptance and change are opposites. Like if I accept that something is the way it is, then how is that gonna change anything? I'm just like, I just accepted it. But like many interesting, you know, many important things in life, uh, there's two sides of the coin. If I am not willing to accept that I am struggling in my marriage, like I'm just in denial, I'm not gonna accept that I'm struggling because maybe I have an education in family science or in marriage and family, and so I should be the type of person that has a really awesome marriage. And so accepting that I am actually struggling, it's like antithetical to me feeling like I'm an okay person. So I'm not going to accept it. Guess what? My marriage is not going to change because I can't accept or even say that this is where I am. This may or may not <laughs> definitely was a part of my marriage. It, you know, I, I majored in family science and marriage, family, human development as, uh, as an undergrad. And I was pretty sure that that meant I was going to be the best mother and wife ever. I was, and I also had a great family growing up. I was like, I mean, all my ducks are lined up. This is going to be fabulous. It took me a very short time to realize I did not know how to be married. And it was very challenging. And, uh, as you know, ups and downs in life and small children and a heavy work schedule for my husband, things got really rough. And it wasn't until I finally was able to say, this is really, really hard. So hard that I don't know that I can do it anymore. Like I, I might not be able to do this. Then I could say, okay that's where you are. That's how you feel. What am I going to do about it? And that was powerful being able to accept. So acceptance is a prerequisite of change. 
uh, when you are assessing a family, conceptualizing what's going on, if they're in denial about the conflicts or about the problems they're having, it's going to be really hard for them to make progress because they they won't accept where they are in the moment. I think about it like a map. Um, if you if you're looking at a map and you say, "Well, I want to go here," but um, but I'm not really willing to say where I am right now. How are you going to get there? You have to say where you are now. And part of that saying where I am now, that sense of acceptance is it, you're not a terrible person for being where you are now. Um, that unconditional positive regard I was talking about. Accepting a person does not mean that you are discouraging change. That is an important life lesson. Accepting a person that they are what they are right now does not mean you're discouraging change. It means that you are recognizing and validating both what they are now and what they can be. So when I talk to a family and when I recognize with the couple, maybe the negative feed, you know, the, the negative pattern that they're in, it would be positive feedback maybe, but negative, uh, feedback loop, no, <laughs> negative pattern in which they're going down, they're feeling less and less connected because of a positive feedback loop. Saying that that's what's going on does not mean that's all there ever is. Because I do believe, and hopefully they believe if they're in therapy, that it can change. Um, another piece of wisdom is love is the greatest motivator. And I think that's because when someone feels loved, feels accepted, feels worthy, feels safe, it empowers them to be the best them. And part of who we are as humans is wanting to progress. So giving unconditional positive regard is not going to keep someone from changing, it will inspire change. And that's true both as a therapist and as a friend and as a family member. Now, giving unconditional positive regard also does not mean not having boundaries. It does not mean um, condoning everything, but it does mean that um, you see what is right now and maybe you help the person see what is right now and you share your vision and love that they can, they can move forward in the ways that are right. And that is probably gonna be a little bit at a time and it will probably be um, not only at their pace, but um, you know, the, the, the next step, maybe it's not the step that you wish it was, but it's the next step for them. And one of the principles in the model that I use as a therapist is trusting the person to know what needs to be done. And when they are in an environment and in a mind frame where there is safety and acceptance and compassion for self and for others, then there can also be clarity about how to move forward. Okay, self-care. Unconditional positive regard goes for you too. Uh, sometimes the people that we are closer to, closest to, like yourself, is you're probably the closest person to yourself, can be the people that it's hardest for us to be kind to. Um, if you want to be able to help other people, you need to be in a good place yourself. So I, mean, I, I don't know what your experience growing up was. For me, definitely my siblings were the people that I fought most with. I didn't fight with my friends. I didn't fight with neighborhood kids. I was an obedient child, did my schoolwork, but boy, could I fight with my siblings because I was really close to them. Um, and how they saw me really impacted me, really sometimes triggered me if I didn't like how they saw me. Um, and for self too, when there's that negative self-talk, um, 
it can often be because because you want to be better. Uh, and like I said previously, and we may talk about again and again throughout the semester, part of learning is repetition. Um, there may be a sense that the best way to move myself forward is to criticize myself. The reason that I need to tell myself that I am a failure or that I um, am not enough or that I should work harder or whatever it is, is because I really want to do well. And maybe if I should myself hard enough, that will inspire me to move forward. It doesn't. Um, at least not in a sustainable way, but we humans tend to believe it. Okay, so kind of on that vein, a reflection question. What is your self-talk like? Maybe it depends on the time. Maybe sometimes you're very gentle and kind with yourself, or maybe about some areas. Maybe sometimes, like if somebody has wronged you, you defend yourself and you are very defensive and stand up for yourself. Maybe sometimes you criticize yourself. Um, but just take a minute. All of us, almost all, I would assume all of us have self-talk, um, meaning how we communicate to ourselves, how we perceive ourselves. So I look forward to hearing what your self-talk is like and maybe the contexts in which it is certain ways. Self-talk is something that I have learned as I have become a therapist, I have to be really aware of. Um, in order for me to like and uh, have positive regard for other people and have hope for them, I need to learn how to do that myself too. And when I myself am not in a good place, maybe I am doubting myself as a therapist or um, just feeling like I'm not successful, then seeing a client struggle becomes a problem for me because it reinforces, oh, I must not be good enough. And then I have a problem with the client struggling and that gets communicated even if not in words. And that impacts the relationship and the client's ability to move forward. So it, the same thing happens um, in my role as a mom and in my role as a wife. Again, the people we're closest to are the hardest to be nice to or to, to see the good in. And what I have certainly recognized in my 20 years as a mom is when I can be gentle to myself and believe in my own value and lovability and safety, then I can extend, can better extend that to my children also and, and see and encourage their worth and value and lovability and all of those things. Even if they're struggling, even if they're, you know, having a hard time in school or making decisions that are not the decisions I would make. So um, self-talk is an important one. All right, that's the end of the lecture for today. Um, I look forward to talking to you all about these things in the lab on Friday. And again, bring questions that you have, um, bring experiences that you wanna talk about or that you'd be willing to share. And we'll also, of course, write those up in digital dialogue and I hope you'll respond to each other. That's part of the digital dialogue assignment also. So that's all for now. And uh, next week, we will start into Bowen Family Systems Theory.